started a new year. A new beginning. But we're in the middle of a process. The world is continuing a process, a process that comes back for a very long time. And in this process, what we're looking for, what we're trying to accomplish, is something called tshuva, repentance. Ever since Adam Mauritian, the first man, was banished from paradise, from Gan Eden, there wasn't a single human being that managed to fully repent and stay alive, stay in their body. So there hasn't been, on this planet, there hasn't walked a human being that fully returned to the glory that was meant to be a natural birthright. There were very big souls. There were people who had tremendous dedication. They didn't go for a single moment of their life not trying to correct the wrong. The wrong that is plaguing humanity, that is plaguing this planet, that is causing all the carnage that we can observe. So there were people, because they had access to the truth from a very early age, they didn't know any other reality. They were completely devoted to the truth. There was nothing within their entire being, within their body, or within their mind, that wasn't devoted to the ultimate purpose. And for this reason, everything they did was meaningful. Everything they did was inspired with the life force that comes from beyond. The life force of the collective, the life force of the being, that made all beings. And therefore, what they did is inscribed in the collective soul. The collective soul is alive now. The collective soul is what gives us life. The same collective soul that they interacted with and gave all their energy, all their power, all their desire to. That same collective soul is here with us now. However, people are not paying attention to her. They're paying attention to all the words, different people choosing different words to pay attention to, but very few are paying attention to the one speaking the words, to the one who created the power so that we can speak words, to the intelligence that designed speech, to the intelligence that's using speech, and so very busy with the words, totally forgot the one speaking. All words come into the world through humans. This is our nature. This is our heritage. This is our power. For Klali so this is our superpower. The Gemara says in Gitan that there's not a single prayer that gets answered that doesn't have some of Klali Sol's attention in it. If Klaiso doesn't desire, doesn't ask, doesn't pray for something to happen, then even if all the other nations will pray for it, it will not happen. Because speech was the inheritance of Klaiso, a Yaakov, this is the power that we were given. Because we chose not to use violence, because we chose to go a different path, we took 
for ourselves, we inherited the power of speech. How did we inherit it? Because we chose to be busy with it the most. And when a human being is busy with something, he develops it and he becomes more of it. So we could choose to work out whatever we think is going to help us get ahead in life. And we chose to develop our speech, to develop our ability to understand and express and create spirits. Because those spirits are running the world. And when we understand speech, we're understanding our design. We're coming closer to the one who's speaking. When we use speech accurately, then our speech runs the world. Our speech runs the world now also, but the intention is not there. And so there's chaos. So when we speak, we're directing the divine force. We're giving it shape, we're giving it form. We're coming from the infinite light and we're bringing into the vessels, we're creating realities. Those realities are going to affect all the different dimensions. The angels know exactly what they need to do because we're sending signals, we're activating nerves. We're doing real things in the spiritual world. There's a lot of movement. Angels are marching by the billions. To us, it seems simple. But in reality, it's not simple. In reality, we are moving, we're traveling through spiritual space. We're changing the location of our spirit. We're changing the instructions in our body. We're moving around the biology that creates our experience. We're connecting certain neurons so that they fire together, and we're disconnecting other neurons so that they don't fire together. All these are the settings that are going to create how we think, how we speak, and how we act. And so to repent, to do tshuva, is to return to the original settings. Return yourself, find the reset button, and return to the manufacturer's settings so that you can take another look at what's going on. With your current level of development, with your current level of intelligence, you want to return the equipment to their original condition so that you can take another look at what's going on and come to new conclusions. And that's called tshuva, that's called returning. Returning from everything that you've built in order to protect yourself and realizing that you have no one to protect yourself from except that thing that you've built. And so we want to come back to a place that is undefinable. It's experienceable. Those who were there, they knew they were there. They enjoyed being there. When we say it's undefinable, it's, it doesn't mean that it's mysterious in the sense that it's some form of a riddle. It's very simple. It's a very direct experience. It's just that words cannot describe. Just like words cannot describe anything in reality. Words are just symbols to direct our mind. They're not real in and of themselves. They create an experience in us that feels real, but nothing happened. Simply our awareness became aware of something and therefore 
we're now including that in our perception. But reality did not change. The experience changed. Who we are didn't change. How we feel changed. So now when we start the new cycle, what's the first thing we're going to do with our new spirit? We're going to repent. We're going to see maybe now there's enough cleanliness, maybe now there's enough newness, maybe now there's enough excitement, and we can return a little towards our original settings. We can remove some of that resistance, some of that anger, some of that confusion that's accumulated, and try to refresh, to feel like a child again, so that we can take another look with fresh eyes. This is the Sarasimha Chuva. Sarasimha Chuva represents a complete return. Ten is a full cycle. Ten represents all the intelligences that we are interacting with. Ten intelligences that are interacting with 22 body parts. Together, 32. Lave. That's the kingdom of the heart. And so, in the 10 days we're returning, we're repairing our relationship with all 10 intelligences that are making our experience happen. And we are recognizing that anything that went wrong in our experience is a result of what's happening on this planet. It's not because any of these intelligences are faulty, they cannot be faulty. If they were faulty, it wouldn't have happened in the first place. We happen. We're happening accurately. We're just not doing it right. And so as long as we don't do it right, it won't feel right. But not because there's something wrong with what was created, but because there's something wrong with how we interpret it, how we interact with it, how we make each other feel. How we make ourselves feel. Which is a result of observing how the people around us make each other feel. That's how we end up making ourselves feel. It's the same patterns, it's the same arguments, the same accusations, the, the same struggles that we observe externally, especially in childhood, they become the internal energy that's running us. And that's what we have to overcome. That's what we have to repent from. We have to return to a place that was before. Before we came to wrong conclusions. We came to wrong conclusions because we saw wrong information. It's not our fault. We're not trying, trying to blame ourselves or put ourselves down. We're trying to realize how perfect we are and how contaminated we've become. We're contaminated because we're so much more perfect than what's going on over here. Otherwise, we wouldn't call it contamination. If we were like this, then we would simply say that this is our nature, but this is not our nature. Something inside every single one of us knows that. And 
And that's because we are perfect beings. Our minds have been contaminated by wrong information, by wrong beliefs, by misunderstood desires, by unhealthy relationships. by a society that's forgotten its true nature. And so we have to repent. We have to return. We want to return. We know that only if we return can we have what's naturally and rightfully ours. And that's exactly what we want. We don't need anything more than that. We already have enough. We just have to find the cashier in order to exchange who we are so that it can affect how we feel. So that our identity matches our real nature. If we would know who we are, we would feel perfectly because we would be attached to our nature. We would remember ourselves. And when we remember ourselves, we wouldn't cause damage to ourselves. We only cause damage to ourselves when we forget who we are and we rely on something else, on something external, on an idea, on a concept, on a thing. And then we don't feel safe, and rightfully so. We are not safe because we've forgotten the source of our true safety. We have to return. We have to repent. We have to wake up from whatever placed a spell on us. Whatever made us believe that they can provide any form of safety. And so the end of this process, the culmination of the repentance, is Yom Kippurim, is forgiveness. Forgiveness is realization. Forgiveness is realization that changes how you feel. That's the only time it's forgiveness. If you still feel the same about it, then you haven't been forgiven. When you realize forgiveness, it means you've realized the nature of sin. The nature of sin is to forget something about yourself. The nature of sin is to lose your dignity. The nature of sin is to forget your innocence. And so to return should change how you feel. To repent means that at the end there is forgiveness. Forgiveness is a recognition of innocence, an innocence that was always there and you've forgotten. And because you've forgotten, you felt differently about reality and about life and about the Creator. And now you're remembering. And because you're remembering, your entire relationship with life changed. If the relationship with life didn't change, there was no remembering. And so Yom Kippurim is the realization that the Creator created life in such a way that you cannot ruin it. To a certain degree, we might even say you cannot damage it, although from our perspective you can, because we don't appreciate pain. When the pain will be over, even the pain will be beautiful and we won't mind it one bit. But as long as there's pain, we cannot say you can't damage life 
because from our perspective you can you can make it more painful you can make it more pleasurable for yourselves and even easier for the people around you it doesn't take much effort there are very low hanging fruits to make life more pleasurable to the people around you it takes minimal effort but it takes a big desire because otherwise it simply gets forgotten and this world is a time where we can buy very meaningful experiences experiences that will be treasured for eternity with very minimal effort because we have the leverage of the angels we just intend and the angels do when we speak the effort it takes to move the mouth has no relationship to the effect of the words the effect of the words is running armies and the effort to move the mouth is minimal by some people it runs itself almost and so this is a place where we can really make a difference for ourselves if we have the vision if we remember what's important if we're not brainwashed by the culture in our culture words are meaningless in reality there's nothing bigger the samatari kanegat kulam the only thing bigger than words is the one speaking them that one we can't even imagine but relative to everything in this world relative to everything we can possess relative to everything that we can perceive by our senses words are of infinite value and what makes them so special on top of everything else is that they can lead you to beyond words they can lead you to the undefinable this is why vitamitari kanegat kulam vitamitari is words but these words are against everything else every other investment that can bring you fruits these words can bring you more than that they can bring you to a place that's beyond words everything that exists in the world of words exists in a world of opposites for every word there's the word that means the opposite every time we say a word when we awaken a spirit we're also waking up unconsciously the shadow of that spirit which is the opposite meaning when we say day the spirit of night is also being activated but in the world that's undefinable there are no polarities there's no spectrum there's no movement there's no possibility of anything other of anything else there's only different levels of immersion based on where we're coming from and how much we remember where we're coming from And so may this be the year where we finally get to repent where one of us may it be any human being remembers the true origin not intellectually 
but with their entire spirit, with their entire being. Because when that happens, when the human being enters that vibration, then all of reality will change for all of us. Life will feel different from that moment forward. It will feel like it never felt before. And as soon as it will feel different, we're going to think differently about it. We're going to say different things about it. We're going to act differently. And suddenly all the questions that we've had and all the things that didn't and couldn't make sense will suddenly make perfect sense. Suddenly we'll realize what was really wrong. And once we understand what was really wrong, then we will see how everything that was wrong was leading us to what's eventually going to be very right. May it happen soon.